now, once again, Raymond Arroyo. Welcome back to the World Over Live. In May of 2008, Rick and Karen Santorum welcomed their eighth child into the world, little Isabella Maria. Now, shortly after her birth, Bella was diagnosed with trisomy 18, a rare genetic condition. Only 10% of these children diagnosed are born alive, and 90% do not live beyond a year. Yet Bella is about to turn seven and has defied all the odds. The way she transformed the Santorum family and touched people all over the country is captured in a new book, Bella's Gift. In it, the Santorums tell their own story and offer hope and guidance to other parents of special needs children. Please welcome the authors of Bella's Gift, Rick and Karen Santorum, and the editor extraordinaire, their daughter Elizabeth. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Ray. Now, tell me about this. When you heard this diagnosis, I remember you telling me, Rick, at this time, to pray for you all because you were told, Bella, don't get too attached. Right. Yeah, unfortunately, she had a diagnosis of trisomy 18, mm -hmm. which is a severe diagnosis. Right. But unfortunately, unfortunately given um, there's a lot of great doctors out there, but some of them will describe certain diagnoses as lethal or incompatible with life, mm. and and then just it was sort of abandoned care. Hmm. And Bella was doing well in the NICU. Uh, and yeah. there was a doctor there who kept saying, why do anything? Just let her go. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no hope here. And we're just so excited. She's a very joyful little girl. And uh, 10 days after her birth, you all go home. Took her home. You go home with hospice instructions. Yeah. Yeah. No hospice care. I mean, they. I we, mean, the doctor went through the whole scenario. Well, yeah, we we got home, and uh, the first the first visit from the hospice doctor was in our. I'll never forget. It was in our uh, living room, and he sat there for a half an hour and told us, described in graphic detail how our daughter was going to die, that she would have a respiratory failure and she would, and, and just, it was horrific. And we were, I'm, I'm saying, and I said, well, what do we do? And so there's really nothing you can do. And, uh, and, and, and in fact, but he did say to comfort her, you can give her some morphine. And uh, a few days later, we had a, our pediatrician come in and we asked him, he said, she said, is, he, is she's on any medication? And, and we said, well, no, she's not. She's actually doing really well, except we have this prescription for morphine. Huh. And uh, so Karen went out and brought in the prescription and he looked at it and said, this is not a dose that will comfort her. This is a dose that will probably kill her. Oh my gosh. Well, thank God she had, Bella did, a pediatric nurse in house, which Karen is from yes. a line of doctors. Um, you really, when you read this book, you realize what an advocate, how important it is to have an advocate and to have a mother who really knows her stuff in this hospital setting because so many times this child faced sudden death and people really, as you said earlier, I mean, it, they, the, the, the medical establishment at moments in the book, they basically say this is not a life worth saving. Just or, let her or, go. Or worth living. Mm. That's that's mm -hmm. that was really what they were saying that mm -hmm. that Bella was not a life worth living because of her physical and mental dis disabilities, her her lack of being uh, a promise to do certain things. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Karen and I, uh, we we love our daughter no matter what she can or mm -hmm. can't do. And mm -hmm. and uh, we committed. Uh, you know, look, the savior here was Karen. You mentioned that she died twice. Karen brought her back to life twice when she was less than a year old and fought for her. And I, I would take a little difference with you in that Karen's being a nurse helped and certainly helped in that situation. Mm -hmm. But Karen was more of, of, the, of, of the mama bear than she was mm -hmm. the nurse. Mm -hmm. She was fight to and you know look up things like I did anybody could and find out what you can do talk to parents it's not I, I don't want people to think oh well Bella's alive because Karen's a nurse Bella alive because Karen fought and we love that's those are the two things yeah. that, that happened. well the book the book really is a meditation on love when you step back I mean that's what I took from it and it's a wild ride I mean I can't imagine going through some of these moments that you describe in the book which we can't get into everything but there were real there, there are a lot of cliffhangers in this book Elizabeth tell Tell me how this affected you, your brothers and sisters. Bella, she can't walk, she can't talk. Many families would look on a sibling like that and say, well, 
Right. W what do we do here? You know, when Bella was born, I was 17. So at that age, you're, you know, you're a teenager, and your next phase is, you know, where am I going to get into college, and what prom dress do I buy? <laughs> you know, and those are your immediate concerns. So it's an, a natural age when I think people think you're more selfish. And then all of a sudden, I had this little sister who was, you know, profoundly disabled. And I remember looking at her and thinking, this, we will never be able to have any sort of relationship with, you know, we'll never be able to talk, you know, we'll, we'll never be able to paint each other's nails and talk about our crushes. But I learned something far greater from that, that the highest form of love isn't what you ask, you know, what you can receive, it's what you can give. Mm. And Bella teaches that, us that every day. Yeah, really, it really is a book about yeah. sacrifice, love, and that giving, and you get back much more than you give, but yeah. the giving is the first part, and I mean, that's what you come away with. Many people will look on your daughter and say, wait a minute, you're good people, you live good lives, you're faithful. Why would God permit mm -hmm. a child like this who doesn't, what kind of life will she have? You would say what to them? I would say you have to completely trust. When we got the diagnosis, I did struggle with the whys mm -hmm. and the sadness and the tears and the anger and once I let go of the why and completely abandoned myself to Christ and His love, mm -hmm. I was fine. There was a peace that came over me. And holding Bella as an infant, I knew God has a purpose for her. He's got big plans for our little girl. We always say Bella is a little girl with a big message mm -hmm. that every person matters. Mm -hmm. Rick, when you and Elizabeth are building a crib <laughs> for Bella, oh, no. and this is in the book, <laughs> yeah. um, so if anybody thinks I, I, this is a, a, a politically correct, sanitized version of what happened, all you have to do is read that story. Yeah, no, that's a pretty, I was wondering why you would include that. Yeah, but, 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 I, we're, I we're, get that but, question but, all the time. But it's, a, but but it's, it's, it's like such a, a dramatic story. Tell people what happened. You're building the crib, well, but you tell Elizabeth. Little, little background. Karen, again, this goes back to the difference where Karen and I were. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things we do, we don't sugarcoat in the book that there were really different. We were in different places spiritually. Oh, it's raw. Yeah, and, and emotionally. And I, having lost a child before, we'd lost mm -hmm. a, a Gabriel. son. Yeah, Gabriel 12 years earlier and, and we were I was told 99% chance your daughter is going to die and and relatively soon so I went into okay I'm going to manage this I'm going to comfort everybody and Karen was no, I'm not I'm fighting for my daughter I and mm -hmm. she's all in and I'm saying okay someone's got to you know and and so Karen's <laughs> we bring uh, Bella home and she starts planning a nursery and we got to set up a nursery and we've got to do all this because we didn't have any, we thought we were out of the baby business. Mm -hmm. I mean, Karen was 48 and I was 50 and we thought we were done. And then comes Bella. And, and so we bought, a, she said, we're going to buy a crib. I said, honey, she's three pounds and she probably, you know, and we're buying a crib and we're setting up a nursery mm -hmm. and we're going to plan for her to be here with us. And so I bought the crib and we're unpacking it. And, uh, and, and I, you know, all time dumb thing to say, I said to Elizabeth, I said, save the box because mm -hmm. we don't know whether we're ever going to use this crib. Wow. And she looked at me and she said, I can't believe you don't believe in her. And she ran over and she tore that box up into pieces. Huh. What did that moment do to you? Oh, oh I was really mad at him. <laughs> I was really mad at him, you know, and more than that, I wanted to be hopeful for my little sister. I wanted to believe that she was going to be okay. Mm -hmm. And you know, in that moment, I needed him to believe that too, you know, because you don't lose anything with hope, right? Uh, agreed. Now, in our final moments here, what is the message that you hope to impart to couples who face not only maybe disabilities not as extreme as those that you faced with Bella, but we all are disabled in our own way, yeah. and we all have disabled people around us. Yes. You know, <laughs> Rebecca could write a book about yeah. somebody she knows who's yeah. not as profoundly disabled, but maybe in his own way. <laughs> uh, what's the message here? The message is that every life matters and that we are not to be abandon those who suffer, mm -hmm. that we're to be there for people who, who suffer. We're not to, to forget them. We're to love them and care for them and have compassion as they live out their own personal life journeys. Mm -hmm. So the book is very transparent because our prayer is that it will reach people who are suffering mm -hmm. and, um, and make a difference. Mm -hmm. I, I, I would say that in addition to that, that um, you know, we, we believe that uh, we stayed together because faith was was uh, our faith was integral. The the fact that we mm -hmm. uh, respected uh, her and and loved her and knew that God had a plan for her, uh, we 
we st the other important part of this book is marriage. Oh. Uh, this is a this is a book on marriage. Uh, Karen by and I accident. by accident. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's, it's, we, it is. Just you know, we wrote it separately. Couples. There's Karen wrote eleven chapters. I wrote seven chapters. Elizabeth sort of edited and, and oversaw the, the, mm -hmm. the production of it. But she uh, she, we we came from very different places, and and people think, well, everything was great and all that. But no, it wasn't. And we we wanted to lay that out for people to understand that if you get up every day and forgive, mm -hmm. and you commit yourself in marriage, and you make it a God-centered marriage, you can get through anything. You no, know, and it really is a meditation on love. And, and as, as ugly, messy, and traumatic as that can be, it it's worth the effort. Yes, Thank you definitely. all for being Thank here. You. Rick, Karen, Elizabeth. Uh, the book is Bella's Gift, How One Little Girl Transformed Our Family and Inspired a Nation. It's available at bookstores everywhere, and of course online, and through the EWTN Religious Catalog.